Hi, I'm Dr. Ian McCullough from Johns Hopkins University. This is a short lecture on influence and behavior. Our objectives for this lesson are to discuss the reason action theory, uh, which is a common model of behavior change. And we're using this to kind of show how social network analysis impacts behavior change and influence. Uh, we're going to talk about how empirical data supports the reason action theory model and then how social network analysis in particular interacts with that model. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about conducting effective target audience analysis. Uh, that's a term referred to when you when you are going to target an advertisement, messaging campaign, political campaign, whatever, to a certain group of people, that's kind of like your target audience. And so then you want to learn about that target audience and, and figure out how you can tailor your messaging, your delivery platform, in a way that's going to actually reach that group of people and make an influence impact. So let's begin with the reason action theory model. Uh, so behavior change, represented with a B here, is a function of attitudes, represented with the A, injunctive norms, with the IN, descriptive norms, DN, and control beliefs, or perceived behavioral control. And then the little Ws represent weights. So let's talk about how this uh, works. So basically, people have attitudes, uh, you know, things that they like, dislike, beliefs that they have, that's going to affect how they're going to interpret stimulus and how they're going to make decisions. There's also norms, right? So how do uh, the opinions and values and judgments of important people and, and peers, how does that affect decision making? We saw a little bit about that earlier in the course. Uh, and then control beliefs are, hey, does a person actually feel like they can implement this behavior? Do they feel that they can actually uh, uh, make a change? And if the answer is no, then uh, the likelihood of them um, um, implementing any kind of uh, behavior change essentially goes to zero. So um, we'll go into more depth in each of these here momentarily. A lot of times people keep norms as just one factor, right? So it's attitude norms and control beliefs. I've broken norms into injunctive and descriptive norms because they have an impact on how we think about social network analysis in this space. So let's talk a little bit more about attitudes. Attitudes are a summative function of beliefs and the evaluation of those beliefs. And so summative function, like if we take something like smoking, for example, you know, there's an attitude that smoking is bad for your health. It can cause cancer, right? But there's also attitudes of it can reduce anxiety. It can help me with weight control, right? So there are a number of attitudes that people have towards the behavior of smoking. Now, if you were to say, hey, their attitudes towards NFL football teams, they may accurately identify the Steelers are like the best team in the NFL. That's great, but that's not relevant to smoking, so we would not include it in the model as much as that disappoints us, right? So uh, it's a summative model of relevant beliefs, and then the evaluation, is this good or bad uh, towards the attitude, you know, behavior of smoking? That, that's kind of what we're talking about with this model, and there's multiple uh, uh, beliefs that we're, we're discussing. So... What does this allow us to do? Um, it allows us to uh, design campaigns if we want to affect attitudes, right? So we can either introduce new beliefs like, hey, uh, girls you might be interested in dating are going to think you're gross if you're smoking, right? That might be a new belief that the target audience has never thought of if they're adolescent boys, right? And so you're introducing a new belief that might then affect how they are going to behave. Uh, you could change their evaluation of current beliefs, right? So, you know, people believe that smoking is bad for their health, but they often believe that that's not something that's relevant to them now. That's going to happen uh, a long time from now. Well, if you can make them feel that the danger is more immediate, that it's going to affect them, uh, you know, more today, then uh, you're changing their evaluation of the beliefs. Or you can, uh, you know, affect the relative importance of beliefs. You can make them say, hey, you know, finding a date is way more important than anxiety reduction or uh, weight control, right? So you're, you're going to, you can play with the relative importance of those beliefs. And so these are strategies you can have behind an intended campaign. If we turn our attention to injunctive norms, an injunctive norm, there's a normative belief now, that's the N. And then there's the motivation to comply with that. So when we think, if we keep with the cigarette smoking uh, analogy here, um, you know, a parent might be an important actor in the life of an adolescent. So that would be an injunctive norm. But what is the motivation of that adolescent to comply with the normative values of the parents? Compared to a different injunctive norm, maybe by a popular person in the high school, right? There might be an increased motivation to comply with that actor. So the, uh, the injunctive norms are normative beliefs and probably the judgments those actors are going to have on you as an individual or the target audience as individuals. 
and uh, we're looking at what is that belief and what is the motivation to comply with that belief, right? Um, and so this uh, this gives you another set of things to target in, in an intended advertising campaign. I will add that motivation to comply is not measured effectively in the literature. That's an area of open research where people are trying to figure out better measures uh, to assess whether people have a motivation to comply. I believe that simply breaking the, uh, the norms into injunctive and descriptive norms helps that out quite a bit. And also looking at what position a person has in the social network is kind of a promising way of, of looking at that. If we turn our attention to descriptive norms, uh, you'll see, hey, it's the same equation. You're absolutely right, right? There's the NM for injunctive norms. There it is for descriptive norms. Same equation because it's still a norm. There's still a motivation to comply. The difference here is just that the norms are coming from peer groups instead of important actors. Perceived behavioral control. Uh, this is a function, a summative function of control beliefs, which is um, does the uh, you know does the audience feel they have control over their behavior? And then P is what is their probability they can accomplish the behavior? Right. So um, you know you might feel like well yeah I could quit smoking if I wanted to, but the probability I could do that given that I'm addicted is very very low. Right. So then that kind of lowers that control belief to uh, you know to to make it where it's not going to really motivate them to try and do uh, any kind of behavior change, right? So you can introduce new control beliefs. You can alter existing beliefs. You can change the evaluation of, uh, of the probability. Um, a great example is, you know, New Year's comes and, you know, gyms offer very low-cost memberships. And what do they do? They immediately pair you up with a physical trainer. Why? Well, the physical trainer is attempting to put you through a physical training routine to... Uh, increase your sense of probability that you can accomplish the behavior of working out. And so they're attempting to target control beliefs as a way to get you to be regular gym members and uh, then you know be regular clients of the gym. So if we look at this equation again, um, I told you that I've modified it from the traditional reason action theory model. And what I've done is I've put the attitudes, injunctive and descriptive norms in parentheses, and I've multiplied them by control beliefs. Why? Well, if you don't believe that you can do a behavior, if you, if you don't have any belief that you can adopt a behavior, it does not matter what I do to your attitudes and normative values you're not going to have behavior change because that just zeroes out your likelihood of, of adopting any kind of behavior. Now, ideally with this model, you would go out, you collect a bunch of data, you'd estimate the mathematical weights for each, you'd identify what is your greatest vulnerability uh, for influence, and then that's what you would use to target for an ad campaign for influence. But what people tend to do is they skip the math and they just use this as a framework so that they can kind of subjectively estimate, you know, hey, what are the attitudes, norms, control beliefs of the, of the population I'm trying to influence, and how do I achieve some sort of uh, influence effect within that group? Now, we're not going to look at the whole um, theory of reason action. Uh, you can, uh, you know, if you're, if you're really interested in this stuff, um, I teach a course over in the systems engineering program called Engineering and Measuring Influence. Uh, and so, you know, I encourage you to take that. It also involves some neuroscience and uh, eye tracking and other ways to kind of understand uh, how that works, right? Um, but from the perspective of this course, we are just looking at it as a framework to understand how social networks impact influence uh, really in online communities. So with injunctive norms, we're talking about important actors. So we have these terms, opinion leader, key influencer, key communicator. So an opinion leader is defined as somebody that has unusual influence in a social group. A key influencer is somebody that, you know, if, if we were to look at this in an online context, when somebody puts out a tweet or says some sort of message, there's a lot of people that adopt that message or, or propagate that message. A key communicator is somebody that has a large number of followers or a large degree in a social network. So it could be that you're a large key communicator, but when you say stuff, there's very few people, uh, if any, that actually adopt that or, or repeat that or say anything. So that would be a key communicator, but not a key influencer, right? And a key influencer might not be designated as a key communicator if, if they have a relatively small number of followers, but all of them uh, adopt whatever they're saying or, or you know, adopt a, a behavior change when they, when they put out some information. 
The descriptive norms, we're talking about alters, others in the network. We're talking about issues of informational conformity, normative conformity, network conformity. Uh, if you remember some of the, the stuff on ash conformity and network conformity, um, that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. We're now going to turn our attention to high school networks. And uh, it's just a good way to illustrate some of the points. So I'm going to show you a network from a high school. And I'm going to ask you to pause the video, look at this network, and tell me how many clusters or how many groups do you see within the network. All right, welcome back. I uh, Hopefully you've paused and, and answered that question. People tend to report either two or four. So two is if they're driven by the colors, because you can see those purple and pink dots in the upper part of the network, and you see the primary colors in the lower part. And if you've noticed the legend in the upper right, you can kind of understand, well, why are they clustered like that? Well, you've got middle school and high school in America, right? So that, And you see the blue dots are a little closer to the middle school kids, and the yellow dots, the 12th graders, are a little bit more to the edge. So you kind of see that there's grade homophily as driving connections in the network. But if you were looking a little closer, you'll also see that it kind of bifurcates right and left, right? Creating a total of four different clusters. So why has it clustered right-left? Well, if I show you a different view of the network, I think we can explain that. So this is showing uh, racial differences. And, uh, you know, you see the yellow dots are uh, white students, the green dots are black students, and the red dots are some other uh, ethnicity. Uh, this is not my slide, by the way. This is a, a very well-established slide for showing subgroup analysis, uh, which is why I'm using it. But we now see that there is both grade homophily and racial homophily in this group, which creates four distinct clusters. And we may, uh, we, we may think that there are different uh, norms that are likely to develop in each of these four different clusters. And, and some of them are overlapping, and of course there's certain norms that exist across the entire community or the whole school, but uh, the, if you're going to tailor a message, it's probably important in this school to understand what is different about each of the clusters right, in, uh, in the network. And so they're going to have a different set of local norms, and there's going to be different opinion leaders that are going to uh, have potentially different injunctive norms in each of those little four pockets of the community. So what we would do in an influence campaign is the first thing is collect network data. The second thing is try and create some subgroups that are interesting. And then understand what it is about the subgroup as a whole and what it is about individual actors within that subgroups that might be opinion leaders uh, for thinking through how you're going to design an influence campaign. So when we're looking at those opinion leaders, right, these are uh, going after injunctive norms, we've already seen social network analysis, we've already seen centrality, uh, and so the centrality measures give us insights into who are the, uh, the, the key uh, influencers in the network and who are the people uh, that would hold those injunctive norms that we'd be interested in. You'll notice that there's different centrality measures, and the different centrality measures are going to show you different uh, important people in the network. So if you look at degree in the upper left, it kind of finds uh, actors in the upper left quadrant. Whereas if you look at closeness centrality, it's people towards the bottom part of the graph. Between the centrality kind of spreads them around a little bit, depends on the graph of course. And then key player uh, positive, key player negative is uh, centrality measures we haven't really looked at, but what they tend to do is they tend to find uh, nodes that are spread across the network. So they're kind of like representative opinion leaders across a larger community, which is sometimes useful. Although I would say that when you're doing an influence campaign, you tend to be better off focusing your resources in one of those clusters, like in the high school network, one of those four clusters, getting behavior change in that cluster and then letting it spill over to other clusters. Uh, the reason for that is if you spread out your resources, oftentimes you can dilute it to the point where you get no behavior change at all, no influence at all. So those opinion leaders, right, we can, we can uh, represent um, as different types, right? So we're all familiar with celebrities, right? Those are those, those famous people that everybody's heard of. A celebrity is an effective opinion leader from the perspective of when they, when they say something, a lot of people are following them, a lot of people see them, and so uh, it's a good exposure. It gets the message out to more people. There's greater likelihood that somebody that is willing to adopt that innovation, that, that message, whatever, uh, is going to hear it. And so that's why they're effective. But when it comes to actually uh, influencing people, changing their mind about a topic, that is rarely done by a celebrity. In fact, it is usually somebody is important in a social network, in a social cluster. They are an opinion leader, and they hear what the celebrity says, and then they, they interpret it, 
they frame it in a certain way, and then they tell the other people in their community how they should interpret that message, and, and that is going to actually create the, uh, the influence effect. Right? So they say that a Republican and a Democrat can view the same CNN news broadcast and take away two totally different messages, two totally different meanings from the message. So it's not the celebrity that has influence. It is that sociometric uh, opinion leader within the social network that has high injunctive normative uh, influence. They are going to use that for information, and then they're going to deliver the message in a way that influences their people. And so as you get further and further down this list, you get more and more effective, but it also becomes more and more difficult to identify. And so you can use this list to kind of think through how you can identify the most effective opinion leader you can, for, you can find in a network for achieving any kind of influence effects. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, short lecture on uh, behavior change and influence and the incorporation of social network analysis into those concepts. Uh, I'm Dr. Ian McCullough. Thank you.